Okay, so going to carry on. So looking here, a period of hundreds of years, as we know, this is all the sort of vertical conditions of indemnity that true parents, the fathers, try to restore horizontally. So that's why in our own spiritual community, a lot of these things have been going on. They're sort of telescoped into one generation. So the reason why I'm going through these things is all the issues, all the temptations, all the struggles, all the challenges that the first Israel, the second Israel had to face are the same kind of challenges, the same kind of temptations that we face as a spiritual community uh, individually and as a families. So we can understand the temptations, the challenges. We can reflect and think, okay, what do we need to do here? What's going on here? If we can understand our own situation in light of the bigger picture of God's providence, we can understand, should I go this way or should I go that way? Because we're going to face all the same challenges, all the same temptations that other people have faced in God's providence. And we can very easily make the same mistakes and think that's restoration. But actually, restoration is trying not to make the same mistake, trying to do things differently, yeah? trying to break the pattern yeah? and do things differently. <clears throat> so that's why I'm <clears throat> just picking on some of these little events, going into a little bit more detail, seeing how they, you know, what, what's going on. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the National Foundation then, <clears throat> to receive the Messiah, was established. It established a spiritual community, a worshipping community, in which there was religious freedom, and they were governed by the rule of law. <clears throat> so I say about religious freedom, there's a very common saying amongst Jews, the four Jews, five opinions. Yeah? That's just the way they are. They all have their own opinion. Yeah? And so they argue about all sorts of different ideas. So they don't all have to believe the same thing, just they have to live within the context, the framework of the law, not break the law. Yes? But then you have the freedom of religion then, a freedom of ideas, the freedom to bring for the Messiah to come along and to give a new insight into the, this, that, and the other. So that's the kind of community that's established. So they went into Canaan, they crossed over the Jordan then, they went into Canaan, and when they were there, they all settled down to a loose confederation. So there's Benjamin and Judah are down there. Can you see them? Do you know why Benjamin and Judah are so close together? Which, which of these 12 tribes formed the southern kingdom when the kingdom divided? Hmm? There was, you know, the kingdom divided, the 12 tribes, two in the south, 10 in the north. Which two formed the kingdom in the south? Judah and, Judah and Benjamin. So why do you think Judah and Benjamin were together? They're, well, they were all brothers. <laughs> Why these two particular brothers? Hmm? They did. Why do they like each other? No, actually from different mothers. Judah is from um, Leah, and Benjamin is from Rachel. Why didn't Judah offer his life to save Benjamin? That's right, yes. <laughs> Judah was older, Benjamin's younger. And if you remember in the story with Joseph, then when after Joseph, Benjamin had been found with a silver cup in his, in his uh, grain, then Joseph was going to throw them all into, was going to throw Benjamin into prison and say, all the other brothers, you can all go home. But Judah said, I will exchange my life for the life of my brother. What did Cain do? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Judah said, yes, I am my brother's keeper. And Judah then was willing to exchange his life for the life of his younger brother. So it all worked out well. So how do you think Benjamin felt about Judah after that? You can imagine how much Benjamin loved his older brother. Yeah? And how, much, how close these two brothers were and how they settled down together. And that Cain and Abel unity was the real foundation of substance far deeper than anything established by Jacob and Esau. Beautiful story, I haven't got time for it now. <laughs> anyway, it's a loose confederation. And so, basically, yeah, they're a loose confederation with a charismatic leadership. They had no kings, they had judges. So every now and then, a charismatic figure would be raised up by God, who would judge the people, who would lead them into war, who would do this, that, and the other. 
<clears throat> but the key point here was that they had no king because God was their king. God was their king. They were the people of God and they lived according to God's law. They had, God was their king. So one of these particular uh, uh, judges, Gideon, he fought against the... Oh, on his Sunday school. Gideon the... No. <laughs> Gideon the Midianites. Oh, never mind. Anyway, so Gideon then, he defeated the Midianites, and after that, the people said, wow, you're an amazing person. We want you to become our king. And this is what Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Yeah. So he turned down the opportunity to become the king and to set up a dynasty because he said, no, God is ruling over us. God is our king. And this then was the vision. They're ruled by God's law, and God was their king, and they would live according to their conscience. They would live according to their conscience. They worship God. So could they see God? God was invisible. All the other people in the ancient world, they all worshipped idols that were visible. A lot of the people in the ancient world, they accused the Hebrews, they accused the Israelites of being atheists because they worshipped an invisible God. Which is easier, to worship a visible or an invisible God? You think so? <laughs> Which is easier, to worship a God who's invisible or one who's visible? Visible. Yeah, it's just have a statue, you come down, you bow down to your statue, you feed the statue food, etc., etc. It's much easier to worship a visible God. Just like sometimes people say, well, I believe in God if you can show me him. If I could see God, I believe in God. Yeah? People want a visible God to believe in and to worship. But actually the God of Israel, the God that Abraham discovered, was an invisible God the God who created the heavens and the earth. And you could only meet God and speak to God in your original mind. So in order to be able to worship God and speak to God, what do you need to do? You need to pray. You need to live a religious life. You need to live a spiritual and moral life so you can actually experience and meet and feel the presence of God in your mind and in your heart. And so that's why it's so important then to live that kind of life. Is it easy to live that kind of life? No, it's hard work. But that was the kind of society that the Hebrews created when they crossed over the Jordan and they went into Canaan. It was a confederacy. They lived according to the law. Every now and then a charismatic leader would be raised up to, to lead them for whatever reason. But God was their king. And it was God that they worshipped. No human being, no statue, no idol. They just worshipped the invisible God. And they worshipped God through their original mind. That's why it says, listen. Where do, you, where do you hear God speaking to you? Apart from through me, of course. Where do you hear God speaking to you? Right. But where do you hear that? In your heart. In your... Oh, David. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, you hear God in your mind. You hear God in your heart. That's... So that's why you have to listen. So is it easy to listen to God? Is it easy to hear God's voice speaking to us? No. Why not? Yeah, because it's like a you know, it's like a, it's like all these noises, like a radio, you know, all these voices, all these things coming in. So how, yeah, so how can you hear God's voice then? You have to become very quiet. You have to become very peaceful. You have to meditate and to pray till you can actually hear God's voice resonating and resounding in your heart, in your mind. Yes. That's why, that's why it says, listen, hear, O Israel. So you have to find that deep inner peace so we can hear God's voice speaking to us from within. That's where God wants to dwell inside. It's okay, so, usually when other people are asleep as well. That's right. So I have to wake up early. Okay, so, so let's have a look. What kind of society did they establish? This is uh, Lord Acton, a historian. He said, the government of the Israelites was a federation held together by no political authority, but by the unity of race and faith, and founded not on physical force, but on the voluntary covenant. The principle of self-government was carried out not only in each tribe, but in every group of at least 120 families. And there's neither privilege of rank nor inequality before the law. Monarchy was so alien to the primitive spirit of the community that it was resisted by Samuel. So what does that sound like? Sound like they established a family federation, doesn't it? <laughs> a federation of families. Yes? 
That's what it's all about. Yeah, and so that was what it was, the voluntary principle. They were volunteers acting out of their own sense of responsibility, cooperating together, working together as families, and then as large groups of families, they form, you know, that would become the structure for the tribe, and then the tribes would try and work together and cooperate together. Do you think it's easy or hard? Is it easy to run a society based on the voluntary principle? No. It's not easy, is it? What do you need? What kind of people do you need? Negotiators. You need good people, hard working, take the initiative, sense of responsibility. Yes? But that's the kind of society the Hebrews, the Israelites, tried to establish um, when they went into Canaan. And they created and sustained, more or less, that kind of society for about 400 years. <coughs> they created a democratic, free society which lasted for about 400 years. Is that a, an achievement or not? Yes. Not bad. I mean, no other country has done that in the modern world. So that's what it was. Founded on a covenant, yes, an agreement based upon law. No king, nobody organising, telling what to do, but just working together, arguing with each other, discussing together, coming up with a plan and implementing the plan. And so from time to time, one particular person got incredibly inspired and became a charismatic leader, a judge. But, you know, after he died, then, you know, it wasn't passed on. There's no hereditary thing. Anyway, I said it's difficult to sustain that sort of thing. And so after 400 years, the people came to Samuel, who was the last judge, and they said, we want a king over us. Then he will be like all, then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. In other words, why can't we be like everybody else? Everyone else has a king. It's such, so difficult to persuade people to get an army together. We just want someone to tell us what to do. We want someone to give out the orders. What? Someone to raise an army. We want someone to raise an army, to give out the orders, to organise everything. It's too difficult doing it ourselves. It's too difficult trying to work together. It's too difficult trying to cooperate with these people over here. We want someone to tell us what to do. So I don't have to think. I don't have to decide, make the decisions. Someone else can make all the decisions for me. Yeah? Is that a regular temptation? Why can't someone else look after it? Yeah? No. Anyway, so Samuel went, God replied to Samuel, listen to all the people that are saying to you, it's not you they rejected, they rejected me as their king. Yeah, so they lost confidence in who they were. Yeah, I, that's the most important commandment. I am the Lord your God. They forgot that God was their who they were, and they thought, we just need a king like everybody else you know, to tell us what to do. So in that sense, rejecting God. So God said, okay, you can, you can have a king, but look, this is what's going to happen. This is what your king will do. He'll conscript your sons as soldiers. So all your sons will be, joined, will be put into an army to fight his wars and battles. He'll turn your daughters into servants to work in his palaces, he will take your fields and your vineyards, the best fields and vineyards for himself. He'll take one-tenth of the harvest, that's the taxes. It wouldn't be nice if taxation was only 10%. <laughs> anyway. Hmm? Well, yeah, I don't know. He'll take one-tenth of your flocks and eventually you shall be slaves. In other words, you become what you were. So that was the warning, yeah? That is the challenge. So it's very interesting then. Saul became the first king. And uh, the reason why Saul became king, whoops, go back a bit, because the people didn't like Samuel's son. So Saul and Samuel anointed Saul, became the first king. And then Saul had a son called Jonathan. So after Saul died, who, do you, who would you expect to become the next king? Jonathan. Jonathan, okay. But Saul made certain mistakes. And so God told Samuel to go and anoint David to become the king after Saul. So David then has become anointed and chosen to become the next king. What's, it, what's the problem here? Saul's still around. He's not the son of Saul. He's not the son of Saul. So how is he going to become king? Through friendship with David. Jonathan's friendship with David, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, he can't go, so what would happen if, if David went along to the palace and said, look, Samuel just anointed me to become the king after, after Saul dies. What would happen to him? They'd kill him. They'd kill him. He'd, he'd be put to death. It doesn't work like that. You can't say, oh, well, I've been anointed, therefore, give me the power. Yeah? 
that the way, yes, David then is younger, he's in the position of Abel. Cain is in the position, Jonathan's in the position of Cain. So what does Cain and Abel need to do? Yeah, so Abel needs to win the birthright. He needs to win Cain's respect. Is this another parallel? Yes, if you want. <laughs> if you want I'm to just ask if you're doing so, because otherwise... I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, this is because all, these are the same sort of challenges that when they had to face and we are facing with sons and inheritance and everything, and how to go about it in the right way, how not to make the same mistakes. That must be obvious, sorry. I mean, you know, this is the life we're living. This is God's providence. This is what we're trying to restore. These are the same sort of situations our own spiritual community will face, these challenges. We have to think, what do we do? How do we face this? How do we overcome this? How do we solve this historical problem which we need to restore? Hmm? Who's David? What? What's obvious? Okay, well, I'm just, Simon was asking me, so take it up with Simon, please. <laughs> anyway, so this is what's, in, but anyway, what's really interesting is David didn't go to the palace and say, you know, hand me the goods, you know, I'm going to become the next king. So what happened, David was a young boy, and one day his father Jesse said, oh, you know, take your, your brothers a Red Cross parcel and some lunch and tell me how the battle is going, because at this time they're fighting the Philistines. <laughs> And so David went off and said to his brothers, you know, how's things going? And then he saw Goliath in the valley. Goliath who's challenging the Israelites to come out and fight with him. And David said to his older brothers, why don't one of you go and fight and kill Goliath? And they gave him slap, silly little boy. <laughs> you know, what do you know about war and these things? Anyway, so eventually David said, oh, you know, felt I need to go and do something about this. This is a real problem. So he went along. And uh, cut the long story short, he killed Goliath. So when he killed Goliath, then it's like problems to start. And when he killed Goliath, then he went, took Goliath's sword and his head back to Saul. And uh, this is what it says in the Bible. Jonathan, when, da- when Jonathan saw this, he realized that David is an amazing person. When Jonathan saw David kill Goliath, Jonathan, in his heart of hearts, he felt actually David is more qualified to become the king than me. David would make a better king than me. And so what Jonathan did then is he did this. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan gave his robe and arm and sword and bow to David. So Jonathan gave to David all the things that represented the fact that he was the heir to the throne. So Jonathan transferred to David all the symbols of being the heir to the throne. So the way in which David became the heir to the throne was winning the love and the respect of Jonathan. Yeah? And so that's the way it worked. And so he won his love and respect, and then Jonathan gave him a position. So that's the way it should work. That's the way this Cain and Abel situation should be resolved. Yes? That makes sense? That's the way it works. The way it works historically, and that's the way which we should think that's the way it should work within our own spiritual community as well. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, David was so popular, and as you know, you know, David became the Saul put David in charge of his armies. David went off, killed some Philistines. When he came home, the people chanted, "David is Saul has killed thousands. David has killed tens of thousands." So, how did Saul feel about that? He felt jealous. Yes, was that a good way to react? No. How should he have reacted? Hmm? He yes, he, he should. Have, should he have been happy or unhappy that he, about that? He should. Saul should have actually been really happy. He should have think, thought it's wonderful that I have a general who's a better warrior than a better soldier than me. It's a bit like Alan Sugar. Has Alan Sugar got a PhD? No. no. I think he left school when he was fifteen or sixteen. But he surrounds himself with people who are far more educated than him. Does he feel threatened by them? No, he wants to choose the best people to work in his business. People who are much better educated, much more knowledgeable than him. That's the way a good leader is. A good leader shouldn't feel threatened because somebody who's under them is more clever and more capable than they are. They should actually feel happy and want to surround themselves. A good leader surrounds himself with people who are much more capable than he is. And like Alan Sugar, is very good at managing people. Yeah? 
that sort of lacked in that point, yes? He should have embraced David. Instead, he felt jealous and he tried to kill David. Uh, David, as we know, <clears throat> escaped. And when he had the opportunity to kill Saul, he didn't do it because he loved Saul very much and was very devoted to him. Jonathan then is a very interesting case. So Jonathan then, David then was Jonathan's best friend. And then Saul said to Jonathan, you have to help me to kill David. So what should Jonathan do? Should he do what his father says? Or should he? He told David. He told David. So for Jonathan then, it's very interesting. He loved his father very much. But even though his father, who is the king, told him and to organize and arrange and help him to kill David, Jonathan wouldn't do that. So why not? What was Jonathan following? Because he's following his conscience. He's following his conscience. He felt in his heart of hearts, he felt, that's wrong. Actually, I, what my father wants to do is wrong. I'm not going to allow my father to commit that kind of sin against God. I love my father so much, I'm not going to let him make that kind of mistake. So out of his love for Saul, he refused to do what Saul wanted him to do. And out of his love for David, he protected David. So, Saul, so Jonathan then didn't abandon Saul and go off with David. He didn't hand David over. Jonathan then remained a loving son and he died fighting with his father Saul, but also he remained a faithful friend and kept his promise. Does that make sense? Well, Jonathan then is one of the most wonderful people in the Bible. So when we, look at the, when we talk about filial piety, it's very interesting to look at how filial piety functions in the Bible because there are loads of stories in the Bible about the relationship between fathers and sons and parents and children and brothers and sisters and all these sort of things. And look at these kind of stories and see, I would say, Jonathan was an exemplary model of, a, of filial piety. Yeah. Not obeying his father if what his father said was wrong. Okay. But still loving his father. Okay, anyway, so then Solomon came along. And then he was an amazing person, wrote the Song of Solomon, the Proverbs, a very wise person. He built the temple. And uh, the temple then... From the biblical point of view, the temple is supposed to be the completion of the Exodus. So what's very interesting is to try and understand how did Solomon go about building the temple? That's what it says. Now, King, again, these are all issues we face as well. Read the subtext. King Solomon conscripted laborers from all Israel, 30,000 men. And he sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month. So they spent one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor, and Solomon had 70,000 carriers and 80,000 stonecutters in the hills, as well as 3,500 foremen who supervised the project and directed the work. So what do you think about that? He was like a pharaoh. Yes, he became like the pharaoh. He turned the people into forced laborers. So what was the temple built? What was the basis for the building of the temple? Forced labor. You use forced labor. So all the people then, do you think they got paid? Do forced laborers get paid? No. So in order to, for his grand building projects, that's how he built the temple. It's very interesting to see how the tabernacle was built in the desert. This is what God spoke to Moses and said, speak to the Israelites and have them bring me an offering. Take my offering from everyone whose heart impels him to give. They shall make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell in them. So what's the basic principle for building the tabernacle? Willingness. willingness. For everyone who's willing to give, who wants to give from their heart. Yeah, so it's based upon the voluntary principle. Whereas a Solomon did it based on forced labor. So do you think the people who were building the temple were happy, enjoyed doing what they were doing? No. No. Do you think they, the temple was built with love and heart and joy? No. Sorry? No, well, probably not at all. I mean, if it, <laughs> you know, one third of your time, you have to go and work for free to build it. You can imagine how resentful people probably were. Yeah, it wasn't, shouldn't have been built like that. That's not the, you know, if they couldn't have built something as big and glorious, they should have just built something which people would have felt actually, you know, Let's build what we can do from our heart on the voluntary principle. may not have been as grand, but it would have been done with heart and love. 
So you can imagine then, <coughs> this is, then became a big problem. <coughs> and then Solomon also had lots of family problems. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, and Edomite, Sidonian and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall you they with you, for surely they'll turn away your heart after the gods. And Solomon clung to these in love, so he married lots of people, women, and he loved them. And what came next? He had 700 wives, princesses, three hundred concubines, and his wives turned his heart, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord was, did not wholly follow the Lord, as David his father had done. So what have we got there? We've got 700 wives and 300 concubines. How does that work? No, practically, how does it work? Where, where do the wives live? Palace. Palaces. I mean, do you think the wives went out to work? Who supported the wives? Hmm? The people. Yes. 700 wives, that's a lot of buildings to live in. You know, we have one royal family, and sometimes there's some people, I don't know why, you know, they complain, all right? But you can imagine a king with 700 wives, how many palaces you need to support that, and who pays for that? It's paid out of taxes. So you can imagine then, to support such a vast family with wives and concubines, all the people, all the Israelites then, were paying a huge amount of tax. So all the people then have been turned into supporting this one family, Solomon and his 700 wives. It's gone back to Egypt, isn't it? Created another slave society where everybody exists to support the king. So, you know, that's what happened. You know, not good. Anyway, so God wasn't happy with this. So God was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him about these things. He did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I commanded you, I'll surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. So he's told that the king will be taken away from him and given to his servant. And so how, why did the kingdom split? Again, that's very interesting. So there was somebody called Jeroboam. He was one, he was one of the uh, organizers of the forced labor. And he argued with Solomon about the forced labor system. And Solomon didn't like him, so he had to run away and go into exile. And while he's in exile, he went round the other tribes and made friends with all the tribal leaders. <clears throat> and then, uh, then Ahijah, the prophet, came to Jeroboam and said to Jeroboam, if you walk in my ways, I'll be with you. You will become the next ruler of Israel. And if you walk in my ways, if you follow God's commandments and God's laws, then God will be with him. So God then selected and chose Jeroboam. Anyway, eventually Solomon died, and when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam inherited the kingship. And then Jeroboam and all and the, uh, the other tribal leaders, they came to Rehoboam and they said to him, your father made our yoke heavy. In other words, taxes are really high. Lighten the yoke upon us and we will serve you faithfully. So Rehoboam thought, okay, I'll come back you know, next week and I'll give you my answer. That was the deal. So Rehoboam went and spoke to Solomon's advisors, his father's advisors, and they all said to him, that's a really good idea. Lower the taxes, and then you'll keep the kingdom together, and they'll be faithful and loyal to you. Then Rehoboam went and spoke to his friends, who were all young like him. And his friends said, well, that's a silly idea. Your dad was, he was old. He was sick, you know. He was weak and feeble. You're a young man. Go and tell them that your finger is thicker than your father's thigh. And so Rehoboam went. So when Jeroboam and the leaders came back, then Rehoboam said to them, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. In other words, my father was soft in the head. He was really soft with you. I'm going to be, I'm young and strong. I'm going to be much more vigorous and I'm going to raise the taxes. How do you think that went down? So who made the mistake here? 
Ray Byrne, big error, yes? Yeah, had no, you know, big mistake he made. And so Jeroboam and the tribal leader said, OK, if that's the way you want it, we're out of here. And then the kingdom then was split between the north and the south. And so divided here, and I explained to you before why it was that Benjamin and Judah then they formed this, uh, this southern kingdom. So what can we learn from all this? Well, you know, as I said, Solomon then, he reversed the exodus by reducing the Israelites to slaves, to servitude again. And as it says, the rabbi said, he became a new pharaoh. And so, you know, because of that, then the kingdom split, and the Jewish people, they never recovered from that. It was like the moment when the Messiah should come, actually, everything went wrong after that. By the time Jesus was born, several hundred years later, they're in a very, very weak situation already. <clears throat> and uh, so what does indemnity mean? So indemnity then... Yeah, okay. Wasn't quite what I... Anyway, obviously, saved, changed, I said. So indemnity then means restoring the original position. So indemnity is not repeating things that go wrong. Sometimes something goes wrong, we say that's indemnity. But if something goes wrong, it's not indemnity. It just means we repeated the mistake of the past. Indemnity is facing the same situation, facing a similar kind of situation and a similar kind of challenge and overcoming this situation, overcoming this temptation to make the same mistake. So that's why I brought up all these sort of things. We're coming up to Foundation Day. Everything, all this sort of Hebrew and Christian history is all telescoped. Yes, the same sort of things that they went through over many years, decades and centuries. There's similar sort of things that we're going through just within our own life. Some things we've done successfully and some things we haven't done successfully. Sometimes we've overcome temptations from the past, we've restored things and sometimes we've made the same mistake and we haven't restored things. And so if we don't restore it, then we face the same sort of situation again. So it's not inevitable, you know, that the same mistakes are made. It's not, of course, it's not easy to restore things. And uh, so restoration, then, as I said, is not repeating mistakes of the past, but trying to do it right. So we can see there, sometimes the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jewish people, they did it right. And that's what we should think. Okay, that's what we want to do ourselves in terms of the way in which we constitute our community as a free community, living within the law, Worshipping God, centred upon God, working together, cooperating together, involved in things, taking responsibility. Um, you know, but sometimes they went in the wrong direction. You know, when they wanted to have a king to tell them all what to do, when they did this and they did that, and they didn't want to be responsible. They didn't want to live up to what God was you know, expecting from them. And so again, you know, sometimes we've done the same ourselves. So these are sort of you know, things, uh, you know, some things you might agree with, I said today, some things you might disagree with. Um, I hope so. Um, you know, just trying to throw things out there to you know, help us to think about where we stand, what the sort of historical perspective upon you know, Foundation Day. Because it's not something new in that sense, you know, as it says in the Divine Principle. You know, Moses went that far, and then Josh went on, Jesus went that far, and true parents, fathers continuing completing it. So if you want to understand the perspective on what true parents are doing is to try and understand it in this historical, restorational kind of perspective. <clears throat>